systems analysts in the United States. Integrating market analysis, business development, systems thinking, and social concerns. As president of Crossroads Resource Center in Minneapolis, he holds 41 years experience in inner city and rural community capacity building. His finding food and farm country studies have promoted local food networks in 95 regions in 32 states and one Canadian province. As coordinator of public process for the City of Minneapolis Sustainability Initiative, he guided over 85 residents in creating a 50-year vision for the city, including sustainability measures. He served as an advisor for the USDA Community Food Projects, including managing the proposal review panel, and serves as a contributing editor to the Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems, and Community Development. He's convener and co-chair of the Community Economic Development Committee for the Community Food Security Coalition, and he taught economics at the University of Minnesota and at the Harvard Kennedy School. His topic today is local food as a strategy for economic development. So let's have a round of applause for Mr. Kennedy. Can everyone hear me in the back okay? I've got a mic on. If it's not working, let me know. Just wave, wave, wave your hand and I'll try to do something uh, to, to respond. But I'm, uh, I usually like to stand out here in front of the podium, but I think I'm going to have trouble seeing the slides myself unless I hide back there. So let me just start out here. And uh, what I, I, I'm really happy to be in Sheridan. I was, I was telling Amy uh, earlier, I, I don't think I've been here since I was 12 years old, so I, I don't remember much about my last visit. But uh, it's very exciting for me to see the mountains, and it's a lot warmer here than in Minnesota. I left, uh, flew away just before a big snowstorm came in there, so I'm happy to be kind of uh, cooling my heels here for a few days and just seeing what I can do. I'm also going to Red Lodge, Montana tomorrow night to speak up there, so this has some sort of a nice broader regional discussion we get to have. What I want to do tonight is basically three things. Um, my presentation will focus, first of all, a little bit on how I think about this food issue that's really breaking, up, breaking out all over the United States right now. And I'm in this kind of rare privileged position to get a lot chance to travel and see folks like you in meetings like this all over the United States. So I want to first of all tell you a little bit about where I've been and also how I think about the food issue, why I do what I do and what drives me to do that. And the reason for doing that is basically gives you a chance to compare your thinking with mine and help you understand where you might agree or disagree with me just so I can be explicit about my assumptions and we can, we can talk from that. Then, um, usually in the middle of my speech, I show data about the local regional farm and food economy, which I, I haven't done a study of shared in area yet, so I have a, a few data highlights that I gathered quickly off the internet uh, in the last couple of days that give you a little glimpse of some of the issues that I see breaking out in Sheridan with agriculture. It will be a very meager glimpse, but it will give you a little sense of what the data can do and also um, what some of the conditions here look like. Um, I have to warn you, some of the data that I often show can be a little bit discouraging uh, because there's some bad news in the agriculture story nationally as well as in lots of locales I work in. And, and the reason I, I say that is, uh, I, don't, I want to warn you it's coming up, but I also want to tell you that I show that data not because I want to discourage people, it's just that I think it's really very important to be honest about what's happening and really address the reality as far as we can, and I think the data shows that pretty well. Um, finally, uh, hopefully when that's over, you'll, be let, you'll, you'll still be able to stay with me, and uh, at the end I'll promise you some examples of really cool stuff that's happening around the country, and these are not necessarily the best stories that could be told or the only stories that have been told. They're the ones that I can tell the best, that the group partners I have and the groups that sort of seem to be doing the most, in my experience, of really creating a transformative set of options. So that's what I want to do tonight. If I say something confusing, by all means, raise your hand. This is a small enough group we can be quite informal. Uh, we will have some time for more substantive discussion when I'm done. And um, I'd encourage you to keep the big questions for later. But if I say something that you know, kind of makes seems uh, confusing, let's make that clear before we go forward. As uh, Connie mentioned, I've been working on the United States. And I now have, I, I always have kind of a new map uh, of the places I'm able to visit. And, I show this partly because it's really fun for me to keep track of how many states I'm ratcheting up. I only have 18 left, and Wyoming's still one of them uh, that I'd like to really kind of cover around the United States. But what, this is also a map showing how broad this local food movement is. It's actually very hard to tell from the media how widespread this is and how what cool work is happening because we're kind of 
typecast by lots of the major media as too small to matter. We're getting a lot of good local press, we're getting a lot of good local discussion, but it hasn't really penetrated the, the breadth of what's happening. And I've been around a long time and I've seen many social movements erupt and I've never seen one that erupted in every state of the United States so rapidly in such a short time. So I think this is really a very important transformative moment in American society. But I also like to show this map because no funder said to me, can't go out and find these places and educate them. That wasn't the process here. It was mostly because through the Food Security Coalition and through networks that local food leaders have built, the word has been spread by word of mouth. So I, I gave a speech in Illinois a couple of years ago, and five weeks later I get a call from Puget Sound because someone had heard the word, and they wanted to find out what I do and see, to see how to bring me to their area. And that's what I like the best about this. This is a very self-organized movement that's erupting in a, way, a lot of ways that are hard to predict. It's not centralized, but it really does have a lot of the elements of really um, people kind of grabbing a hold of their own future and saying, we want to do things in a different way. And I would argue that some of the most transformative groups in the country find me pretty early in the process. And that's why I'm so proud to kind of show you where I've been. And uh, of course, I'm very lucky to to see all these places firsthand and to kind of get educated the way that I can about conditions on the ground. So let me start talking about my philosophy a little bit, just why I do what I do. I like to begin my presentations by look, asking what a food system should accomplish. Because often we kind of miss that step, we get very excited about act action, we don't step back and say, what's this really about? I would argue that a successful food system should build in our communities, places like Sheridan, Sheridan County, northeastern, north central uh, Wyoming. It should build health, wealth, connection, and capacity. And I don't think it would be any surprise for any of you if I said food is really central to health. We all know that that's the first thing any of us can do to try to reduce our chance of getting hospitalized, to reduce our medical care costs. It's a really important thing uh, to eat well to have the best life possible. I also don't think it would surprise anybody if I said that farming, uh, well, I should say the, the food system should build wealth, especially for farmers. Because if farmers are not making good money raising food, it's going to be very hard to say that our agriculture is sustainable in any way. So I think those two are pretty straightforward, and people understand that pretty clearly. The next two are a little bit more obscure in, in our public discussion. I go to a lot of policy discussions where people don't talk about the fact that we need to connect around food. And I think that's really one of the most fundamental things we can say. If I were to have my family over to uh, a dinner on a holiday, I would serve the foods my mother used to serve to me at Christmas time, or my great-grandmother would have served to her when, at the special occasions. And what were the foods my great-grandmother would have served? They would have been the foods that were special to her region in, in Europe. They would have been what was easy to grow there, what was special to that region that no one else had. It really had a lot to do with place and identity and cultural belonging. And yet we have policy discussions that assume that we don't need to have culture around food. I think it's really a, a big gap in our, in our policy work. I think it's really important that we do connect around food. Uh, it's very central to ethnicity, to our sense of culture, our sense of place. Finally, uh, we need to have the capacity to handle food safely. I've just been spending uh, a lot of hours reading about 550 pages of the new FDA rule on produce and processing. And what's interesting there is the assumption of those documents is that people in their, in their kitchens have almost no capacity to take food that might have microbial risks and to clean it or to take care of it themselves. It's like we have to give them a sterile, it's almost like the assumption is we have to give them a sterilized product. And that's not the kind of food I, I like to eat. <laughs> But I think, I think it's a recognition of how much we've kind of assumed that people in their kitchens should have no capacity. We should just have a system that delivers a finished product. I would argue if we had a meeting like this in Sheridan County 100 years ago, most everyone in the room would have been a farmer or would have known a farmer. Most everyone in the room would have known how to separate meat from vegetables to keep while well, cooking, to keep them from being contaminated. Today, I have colleagues working in inner city America who find that people don't have pots or pans in their kitchen because they don't think that has anything to do with eating. They're basically used to going out to a restaurant or buying something from the store, putting in the microwave, opening up a box, and eating. I would argue that for all the bells and whistles and the pretty packaging our food has, has achieved, we're actually dumber as a society about food today than we were 100 years ago. And I think that's a huge transformation we really need to address if we're going to have a successful food system. So I think that's really a very key part of the process, which is, again, overlooked very often in the policy discussion. The data I tend to show, and I won't have a time, I don't have enough local data to perhaps be, perhaps be persuasive about this, but it tends to show 
that the food system we have is failing on all four of these counts. We're building bad health outcomes at considerable public expense. We're building wealth for some people at the expense of others instead of built wealth in our communities. We're actually getting more disconnected from each other instead of connected. And as I mentioned, I think we're losing our sense of knowing how to handle food well ourselves. So I would argue, if you think this is a good paradigm for the future of food in the United States or Northeast Wyoming, North Central Wyoming, uh, we have some serious work to do. We have to roll up our sleeves and really start thinking about food in a very different way than we have for the last several decades. It's not going to be easy to do. It's not going to be quick turnaround or fast victories. But it's really, I think, fundamental to turning the whole society around. The main economic insight that my research would give you, and if you remember nothing else from today's presentation, Bill asked me the take-homes earlier at lunch today. And I said one take-home is that the food system we have is extremely efficient at taking wealth out of our communities and giving it to someone else. Usually a banking system, often a corporate structure. And this is something that a lot of people would just soon not talk about because it makes us a little awkward and uncomfortable to have this reality in our faces. But I would argue the groups that I work with that ignore that reality end up attaching to a system that's working against them and they say, how come we're never getting ahead? Uh, and I would argue those groups that understand this reality can be strategic with that reality and start moving with a system that may not entirely support their goals but can give them some resources to move forward in small steps. So I think this is really crucial to recognize. The groups that recognize this, in my experience, go the furthest, but it's also a slow process. Um, as the title of my speech might indicate to you, I've, actually been, I've been saying for about 10 years now that what we call the local food movement is very central to turning, about American, or turning around the American economy. And I don't say that lightly. Um, I've been saying it since before the banks crashed in 2008, and I think it's even more true today. We spend as a society $1.2 trillion a year buying food. That's more than three times the value of the Apple Corporation. It's more money than we needed to bail out the banking system back in 2008, 2009. It's quite a bit of money. Moreover, each one of us in this room, if we're able to, spend some of that money three times a day buying food. Nothing but food involves all of us in hourly decisions about what kind of farms do we support, what kind of future do we create for our grandchildren. There's another reason food is very special. If I came to you and said, you know, I had a bad month in April, I decided to opt out of the market for food this month. People might chuckle a little bit and say, well, wait a second, Ken, because you might end up at the Sheridan Hospital at, at your expense. We can't really say that anyone's out of the market for food. Again, nothing but food and perhaps childcare forces us to be so inclusive. If we can't make sure that everybody has the best food available, if we can't build an economy based on inclusion, including everyone, we really don't have a good food system. I see some people arguing that low-income people can have lower quality food that doesn't value as much as, the, as what the rest of what other people have. That's nonsense. Who needs better food more than low-income people? Who needs better food more than young children at school? And yet we have this assumption that price makes rules our decisions. I think it's we're really forced to create a, a, an economy around connection and around building community with our food economy if we don't do it here in this crucible of the local food movement. I don't see how we build windmills in a better way. I don't see how we build cars in a better way. And I don't see how we build banking systems in a better way. I think this is really the crucial work we have to do. So I think what you're doing in building local food networks here in Sheridan is extremely important to the future of the United States as well as your region. Finally, the, the point I'd like to make is when I use the word local, it's a shorthand. Um, I will not say tonight that all the food you folks eat in 20 years should come from within Sheridan County. I wouldn't mind if that happened, but it's not my measure of success. If you do that, more power to you. But I think more important than food miles is a real sense of how we do our trade. And I've already hinted this directly, but I, to me, the real success is if we build community-based networks of businesses and other people who trade with each other. If we have a local farm that sells to a local buyer, who sells to a local restaurant, who buys food from a local, uh, I'm sorry, whose, whose employees buy from a local store, we start creating a sense of local trade, economic trade, that allows the dollar when it's earned to cycle through the community several times before it leaves. That's the fundamental work. If we do that well, we're gonna find our food miles go down. Um, but that, to me, is really the goal, is to really build those networks, to build what I call food webs, when we talk about connecting, in a, in a way that's about networks that are changing, that are rapidly, rapid, rapidly dynamic, 
and not kind of locking ourselves into a really close measurement of success. I think that's really crucial work to, to, to mount. Well, that's all been kind of abstract, so let me now tell you a story that will indicate what I mean. And I like to tell the story about Athens, Ohio. It's in Southeast Ohio, um, mostly because, again, I've interviewed these people and I can tell their story with some success. But uh, I like to bring something from outside of your area, so I'm not picking favorites here in the local community. Um, this slide actually represents about 40 years of organizing in local foods in Southeast Ohio, starting in the 1970s, where a group of young folks primarily sat down and said, you know, I'd like to farm, but I want to know that people eat my food. I don't want to just put it on a truck and have it go away forever. And some young, young folks and older folks in Athens have said, I'd like to buy food at my rest local restaurant that was raised by local farmers. I'd like a sense that I'm building a local place to live. And out of that came several farms, a couple restaurants, well, the Crumbs Bakery in Casa Nueva, a Mexican restaurant. The Mexican food there is not quite as good as you can get here, but it was, it was, it was good. And it was, they were both committed themselves to buying food from local farmers and selling that to local neighbors. Where did those folks meet? The best place to meet was the farmer's market, which became not only a training center for farmers to sell their produce, but also a place where you could meet the new farmers in the area that were raising food. If you were a restaurant, you knew where to go to find the new farmers. If you were a farmer, you knew how to hook up with restaurants because they would come by and shop from you. So this actually had a very prominent role to play in helping build those connections. Well, uh, people tried to start a food cooperative. I noticed there was a cooperative store in Billings as I was coming through town yesterday. Well, the co-op in Athens never took hold for some reason. And I don't know the reasons for that, and I don't really need to get into that tonight. The main thing is that the leaders of Athens sat down about 10 years after starting this and said, you know, we can keep starting one business at a time and seeing which ones uh, succeed and which ones fail, but could we create a system that makes it more likely that all of us would succeed rather than creating a system where some of us don't do and some of us don't? They thought about that for a couple of years, came up with a plan, and their plan actually was very interesting. They came up with an organization, a new one called ASNET, which stands for Appalachian Community Enterprise Network. They're in the foothills of the Appalachians in Southeast Ohio. And the first step they took was to build a community kitchen in a low-income community of Southeast Ohio. The idea being that we have poor people who are not eating well, and instead of just sort of handing out food and waiting for them to stand in line to get food handouts, how about if we give that community a facility where people can cook, process their own food, their own food products, perhaps make a livelihood out of creating new food for our, our region rather than waiting for handouts. And so that was their transformative idea back about 15 or 20 years ago. Today, the Kroger store in Athens, the big supermarket, the kind of the Albertsons of Ohio, I guess you could say, the Kroger store in Athens features about a 25-foot shelf featuring Ohio-made products, many of which came to this food processing center in, in Athens, Ohio. The concept was very simple. If you Let's say I'm a poor person and I have like my, my grandmother's raspberry jam recipe, or I have a salsa recipe that no one else makes. I could go to the kitchen, I could get a commercially safe kitchen with a certified chef in charge of it. I could get business experience to help me with making a business plan, maybe making a label and a branding for my product, maybe do a whole kind of publicity campaign to really make an idea that I had into a real workable business. And this might take several years, it might not work, but I had the resources at my disposal to take a good idea into perhaps a part of my livelihood or maybe even a new business that would succeed pretty well. So it was a way of giving facilities to the community that transformed the discussion into more how do we produce our own food rather than how do we have better handouts. So as I said, this is 40 years of work. This does not happen overnight. I have a friend named Aunt Jan Libby in Northeast Iowa, and she says, I've heard of slow food, this is glacial work. <laughs> and I think that's really true. And we, we sometimes, especially some of the newcomers, want really rapid success. And I don't think that's the nature of this work. I think it's really about small steps and moving forward in a fairly careful way. But here's 40 years. Without this story, none of the rest, none of, the rest of my story would have taken place. Into this mix comes a family, the, Hall, the Dix Hall family, that start raising grass-fed beef which was a big step in Ohio at that time. I know you have several producers doing that out here, but that was a big step when they started. And they were milking their cows, and they were selling that milk to a commercial creamery. And they were getting a little bit of premium because they had high quality milk, but they said, you know, if we bottle this ourselves, we might make more money. 
And luckily, they had a friend, and that friend was named Warren Taylor, who had spent his life working for Safeway Foods, designing some of the biggest dairy plants in the world. So they called up Warren, who had just retired, and they said, Warren, we'll give you two acres of our land right next to our cow barn if you'll come and put up a processing plant there. And Warren said, this is the chance of my life. I, just, I can't say no to this. So he actually took out, you know, was lucky enough to be able to take out a million dollar loan and design his own creamery for himself to operate. His, his mentor was a Navy guy. And Warren's mentor said, plan as if you're in the bottom of a ship where space is really scarce. Because if you can do that well, everything else will be easy. So this entire blue console that Warren built, designed and built for himself, allows him to control the entire plant without moving more than a couple steps. All the pressure and temperature switches are there. He can find out if the, if the milk's safe. He can move the milk from the whole milk line, the skim milk line, to the yogurt line without, by just flipping one of those black switches. And he designed this and was extremely efficient to operate. He uses one quarter of the electricity a normal plant this size has. And he also recycles all the water he can so that he reduces his water costs. Basic concept, he uses he developed a competitive advantage in producing milk by doing the right thing environmentally. He has lower costs, and he has some of the best milk in the country. There's a magazine called Milkweed in Madison, Wisconsin that rates, rates the, the high quality milk producers. They call Snow Milk Creamery the number one or number two milk in the United States. Uh, along with Cedar Summit Milk, which I can buy in Minneapolis because friends, friends of mine run that farm. So here you have one of the highest products in the United States some of the lowest cost structure, a brand new plant, a very energetic guy ready to run it full, full bore, and it's a very kind of exciting formula. Warren also made a very big discovery as he was designing the plant. He said he realized that he could take skim milk, which some people consider a low cost item or a throwaway item, and he discovered he could take a nanofiltration process and filter that down from skim milk into a condensed milk that made a really nice base for other industrial food processes. And so Warren discovered this would be a great base for making ice cream. And guess what? He had an ice cream maker about an hour and a half away. So uh, here's his cluster. There's a cluster of activity that Warren has developed around himself. He hires local kids to run the processing plant. He buys milk from two farms depending on the season. He's buying more of his equipment and utilities from outside because that's where it comes from. He doesn't have local sources and he hopes to get more local over time. He's shipping food, he's shipping his milk all the way from Columbus to Washington, D.C., to through Whole Foods stores. He is located at Kroger Athens and also 13 stores across Ohio when I checked in with him. But I want to focus on this relationship here with Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams, which is a high quality, low sugar, local product ice cream made in Columbus in a small scale factory. Warren's condensed milk is the perfect base for them to make ice cream with because it's low fat but it also has a really rich flavor. And it's grass-fed, and it's all those wonderful things. Um, when I met Warren, he was actually spooning up ice cream he had made from that ice cream base. The, the local Paw Paw Festival was happening in Southeast Ohio, and he had a, a bicycle-powered ice cream maker. If you spent five minutes pedaling the bicycle, you made ice cream, you got a sample that to take with you. And it was a very kind of wonderful flavor of Paw Paws that I'd never had before. But he was handing this stuff up for free if you did your time on the pedaling. <laughs> When I talked to Jenny Britton Bauer at Jenny's Ice Cream, she said, Warren and I are on the phone constantly. We do not let a week go by without checking in and saying, how are things going? What's getting in your way? How can we work to, to make things better for both of us? But I think the most important story she told me was, she said she was going to go into the Louisville market pretty soon, which she saw, since is done. And she said, when I decided to go to Louisville, my first call was to Warren. And I warned him about a year and a half, maybe two years ahead of time, I said, Warren, by this date, I'm going to eat this much more milk. Can you do that? And, and she also said, if Warren wasn't ready, I wasn't ready. If he wasn't ready to produce that much milk, I was going to wait on opening up the new store. If you want a good indicator that community-based food networks are flourishing, I cannot think of a better one than having business people communicating directly with each other about how do we collaborate to make a stronger region? How do we make sure we're actually reinforcing each other's efforts rather than acting like fierce competitors who have everything to gain by holding information privately? I can't think of a better indicator. More ice cream? There's the cluster of activity around Jenny's Splendid Ice Cream. She buys all these products on the left column from Ohio Farms, including in June when all the strawberries come in, she buys all the strawberries she'll need for a year from a local farm or two. 
She hires her staff to come in weekends to wash and pick and freeze those berries so she has all the strawberries she'll need for the entire year at the lowest possible price from the freshest possible source. Her, my favorite ice cream of hers is a, a sweet corn blueberry buttermilk ice cream. It comes out in the summertime, it's got this great blend of summer and salt and sweet flavors. It's really quite amazing. Well, um, she's buying this milk from Snowville. She has a windmill on top of the roof of her ice cream factory, and the more she produces her own renewable energy, the more the local multiplier goes up. The, um, she has local employees, so the more they buy from local stores, the more the local multiplier goes up. So what she's doing is building a process of building relationships with her employees, with local businesses, with uh, the, the natural elements that bring her energy to form a stronger local economy. And her question isn't so much what's the multiplier, it's how do I make it bigger? And that's what her business is all about. Well, they didn't stop there. The last I talked to Warren, which is about two years ago now, he was thinking about the fact that he had empty trucks. He was bringing milk in from his farm to Columbus, an hour and a half drive, refrigerated truck. And he said, you know, half my truck is empty. What do I do about that? How do I make this more efficient? So he called some produce farmers nearby and said, how about if I brought your produce from your farm into Columbus so you can have a better market? It'll be cheaper for me to do that than for you to buy your own truck. Some of those trucks cost $80,000 now. I can do it cheaper, um, we can collaborate, we can share some of the cost of that. They said, great. Well, the local food bank said, we have extra space you can store that food in, it'll be ref refrigerated, we have protocols to keep it safe, you can store the food there. And a local grocery store, about 100 feet from Jenny's Ice Cream, said, we'll sell that. So now you have two private businesses and one nonprofit collaborating to get fresh food from Ohio farms from Southeast Ohio into the Columbus market. And their vision, I think, is very interesting. They view this as a step to making sure that low-income consumers in Columbus have access to fresh, healthy, local food from Ohio farms. That's the purpose in their mind for building this network. Again, it's an extension of that idea that, that ASNET started 40 years ago about saying, let's stop thinking about handing out food and think more about how do we actually engage people in an economic set of relationships. But I want to Hasten to add, Snowville Creamery couldn't have happened in 1974 because there was nobody who wanted grass-fed milk. Until that market was built, until that awareness was there, there was no market, there was no ability to do that. There might not have been people who could raise grass-fed, who knew technically how to raise grass-fed cattle and milk at that time. This is all a process of building on prior victories and moving forward in kind of sober steps as you go in the future. So that's what I mean by community-based food networks or food webs. Southeast Ohio is one of the most strong I've visited, but you'll see some other examples soon. Well, this is the point where I usually would talk about the shared and farm and food economy, and I don't have data for you, but a few highlights of, of the shared. This data, I looked up the data for the metropolitan shared area, and that basically gave me shared and county, so that's what you're going to get. Um, this is the population of shared and county compared with the population of Wyoming, and you can see that they're growing basically in step with each other. There was a little bit of a peak in the uh, early 1980s, a little decline, but it's been rising fairly steadily since then. Um, you know more than I do the reasons for those ups and downs. It's not important to my story today, but I think it's, it's good to notice that the population has almost doubled now in the last 40 years, which really gives you a different set of pressures, but also more consumers to buy food than you would have had if you started out doing this 40 years ago. Here's personal income in Sheridan County, the low line, and in Wyoming. And you see that Wyoming, of course, is much bigger and has more income, but if you compare those, uh, I don't know, uh, if you normalize that and compare them, you see the same thing you saw in population. They're pretty much rising at the same rate within their own little unit. So both for Sheridan County and for Wyoming as a whole, um, a steady rise in personal income uh, that you see. And you know, if Wyoming <coughs> folks earn about $28, $29 billion, uh, no, $27 billion of their income, and they're all, in some sense, a market for food you might raise here. That's not trivial in any means, by any means. Uh, let me now show you, uh, hopefully, in Buffalo, from Colorado, I have to say. Um, this is the last 40 years of farming in um, Sheridan County. And th this is data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which takes the farm census data and some tax data and some other data sets that are very private, and they do a computer modeling to say, how much income are farmers uh, earning? And this is all the farmers in the county together. 
The orange line shows how much all the farmers in the county earned selling crops and livestock since 1969. And you can see that that's been a fairly steadily rising proposition. The maroon line, unfortunately, is the how much it cost farmers to produce those products. And that's been rising even more rapidly. And you know, you basically see a very steady rise over time that has not quit at all. If you subtract those expenses from the income, you get the red line, which is the net cash income of farming, or what I call the farm production balance. And you notice that since 1982, that's pretty much been below zero for the entire time, except for a couple dips upward. And um, I think you'll also notice pretty rapidly that uh, in the last few years, it's gone sort of starkly negative. And again, you know the reasons for this much better than I do. I don't know why that happened. But it's, a re it's actually um, a fairly impressive downturn, especially since 2011 was the best year in history for American farming nationally. So it would be very interesting for us to know more about why that happened and what we can do about that. This doesn't really paint a picture to me of a sustainable agriculture in Sheridan County. Does it to you? It, it looks like there's some... You know, we need some of the commodities that farmers are producing. Obviously, some of you folks are producing those commodities. We have some real work to do to think about how do we support that process better? How do we have better policy? What do we do to actually surround these farmers who are working so hard with a better set of outcomes? And yet, I also have to warn you that this is not the end of the story because I like to, I think it's important to adjust this chart for inflation because one of the things that's happened is the value of the dollar has diminished so much that it's the value when we started this chart in 1969 and the dollar was six times the value we has today. And I like to adjust this for inflation to take that into account. And it allows us to ask a slightly different question, which is how hard does a farm family have to work to earn a dollar today compared to 40 years ago? So same data, adjusted for inflation. And you see some very interesting um, conclusions. Basically the same downward trend, except that a dollar earned in 1973 was worth so much more than it is, has, is today that you could actually point to a time when farmers made a surplus of $20 million in a single year. And uh, those days have not been, been around now since the late 80s. And you see that the downturn is still continues there. It uh, doesn't change the fact that numbers are negative. What I think is interesting here is that income has been almost steady in cost of dollars since 1981 or so while the costs have continued to rise. And I can't explain why that's happening. Farmers in this room may know better than I do, but it's a very kind of startling finding, I think, that uh, incomes are plummeting, expenses go up. You don't see that very often. And again, the question is, how long can farm families afford to do this? All told, farmers in this county earn $29 million less today than they did 40 years ago. And this is a time when Wyoming and American farmers doubled productivity. <coughs> you could actually, from this realization, understand that becoming more productive may have been a failed strategy from the farmer's viewpoint. It certainly produced more product for the global economy. It certainly created efficiencies. But it also meant new risk, new investment, new emotional stress that the farmer took on while someone else got the money. Perhaps in the future we want a farming that's less productive and more rewarding. How do we build that? Also, all, all told, too, if, you, if you take since 1989, which is kind of uh, about here in the chart, there's been $370 million more spent by farmers farming than they got in for selling their products. And I, th I would say it's very generous of Sheridan County to do this for the rest of the state. <laughs> but I'm wondering how long you want to keep doing that. But what, what, would, uh, what would be possible in terms of turning that around? Now, I have some suspicions about why this is true. I have some more data I could find about that, but I, don't ha I haven't taken the time to crunch those numbers right now. But my studies typically show that farmers are farming at a very narrow margin or a loss that's getting worse over time, that they're buying a lot of farm inputs from outside that are not sourced in the region. That mean that money flows away while they farm at a low margin. While there's also a local market for food that's pretty substantial, which is being met by bringing food in from far away. That's the tip, typical American paradigm of a regional food economy right now. And in most regions, you see hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, walking away on an annual basis in the very essential food economy that we all need to survive. So again, how do we reconfigure all this? Um, this takes the orange line from the previous chart and breaks it into income from crops and income from livestock. 
So what we see very rapidly is, you know all those new tractors and combines we have out there that we didn't have 40 years ago? It's not improving farm income much, is it? Mm -hmm. But what's really changed is that the ability of livestock producers to make a good livelihood and to sell their livestock, their milk, whatever, has really been diminishing pretty steadily. In fact, it's been um, about the same level now since 1982. Um, this is, again, a national pattern where people have realized the margin for raising livestock has become so narrow that it's very tempting to give up and stop doing that altogether in favor of something else and let the big feedlots or the bigger operators take over. If you want a strong food economy in Sheridan County, I would suggest that one of the first steps you want to look at is how do we actually build a way of rewarding local livestock and milk producers well for what they produce? How do we keep that money locally? How do we have, how do we have a good set of livelihoods earned by local farmers? This is uh, showing the, the, different, the three different kinds of net farm income that farmers get. The red line is what you saw before. It's the, that, it's the uh, net cash income. This looks more jagged because the scales change, but it's basically the same line. The blue line shows how much farmers have earned in what's called farm-related income, which typically now means renting out your land. Because for many farmers, you can make more money renting out your land than actually farming it. So that's become a fairly steady and rising source of income. The uh, orange-yellow line here is government payments coming in, not a huge factor in Sheridan County. But you notice how many years since 1980 federal payments have been a much larger source of net income than actually farming has been. Now, I would imagine that there aren't a lot of farmers out here being really proud of the fact that they're depending on federal subsidies to keep going. And I would imagine there's an ethic here in Wyoming about we made our own way, we made this happen through our own labor, and that's not what the data shows. So how do we kind of find a way to get back to what we think would be the way we'd like to live? Again, I'm sorry to be so brief in highlights, but that's, the, that's what I can do kind of quickly in, in getting ready for one speech, and there's more we can say. Um, how can we make reduce some of those losses by having more, more input source locally? And there are some farms here who are doing this. Obviously, this is a farm in Ohio that takes manure from cattle and um, stirs that up with old straw and hay, um, organic matter from a city, whatever. It makes a very rich compost that can be spread around fields at a very large commercial scale. The more we can build that fertility here in the county, the less we spend for chemicals and fertilizers that come from far away. The more we have machinery that we, that we develop ourselves, or oil sources or fuel sources we develop ourselves, the more we can keep that money in the county. So those are all kind of important issues, I think. Um, the other part of the economy, and I haven't done these calculations yet, is just how much food do people buy. But the one kind of factoid I think I can give you is that if everyone in this county bought $5 of food every week directly from a local farm, $5 a week, it's about $260 a year, so earn, farmers would make $7 million of new farm income. That actually stands up, stacks up pretty well against some of the losses we were experiencing in the earlier charts. Now, uh, you know, I can do this by buying a quarter steer and a half hog from a, two farmers I know. That's five dollars. That's more than $5 a, 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 a week. You can do that in that way, but you can also go out there and connect with a farmer that's doing a CSA farm and say, how do we actually make sure that I support you when I'm getting my produce? And how do we get that farm to sell local, to local institutions and so on? But $7.6 million is nothing to, to sneeze at given the losses farmers are experiencing. So, I think this suggests some of the power of the networking and the local work you can do and you already are doing here in Sheridan County. Well, what I can do better than show you Sheridan at this stage is I can show you some of the national data that's very similar. And uh, I think this is gonna be very interesting. This is actually the last 80 years of farming in the United States, the same data that I showed before. The orange line is what farmers have sold their products for. The green line is what it cost them to produce it. And the red line is the net income from farming. In the last 80 years, where do you see signs of sustained growth in agriculture in America? Arguably the most productive farm economy in the world, arguably feeding the world. Where do you find that in this chart? It's hard to see, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you adjust this for inflation, well, actually I should point out before I do that, what we all know, in 2011, the last year I had data for, farmers sold more products in America than in any year in history. $362 billion in a single year, 
by far the best year we've had. We've had, and we have a lot of farmers saying, "Best years of our lives. Let's keep going." If you adjust for inflation, you see very different patterns once again. Uh, and I think here in 1929, you see the value of the dollar being t 10 or 15 times this, the, the value it has today. It's really quite a bit larger. So you see a pattern where farmers, after during it, during World War II, fed our troops and made better money. Where farmers also fed Europe because after after World War II, Europe was devastated. The farmland was actually blown up by bombs. So we loaned money to Europe to buy products from our farms so that we could, we could have better farm income and Europe could, could eat. This is also a time when new tractors came in, some of the chemical fertilizers came in, allowed us to produce a lot more food in, in, a, in a shorter time than we'd ever been able to do. A lot of people left the farm because they wanted to live in the city after being in the war. A very good time for farm income. But you no, notice also by 1947, that net income was trying to trail away already. It was propped up in 1973. Does anybody know why we had a bump in income in 1973, where farmers made $120 billion surplus in a single year? Is that when the Russians bought all the grain? Exactly. And there's something behind that sale, which is also important to note. Why did the Russians buy the grain? Well, it happened in part because we were responding to the oil crisis of 1973. When the OPEC nations sat down together and said, we want to raise the price of oil, we can do that by limiting production. And um, it was very interesting what they decided to do. They said, we limit production. They got the price of oil up in those days to what was in current dollars would be $40 a barrel. And we were just hamstrung. You may remember people waiting in line two or, th two or three hours to buy gas at a gas station, wondering if they could get gas, what did they get to work. And what was happening was we were spending all this money on oil that went to the Middle East. The Middle East wasn't investing in our economy the way they are now. So that money was kind of leaving our shores. And the folks in the White House got, sat down and said, let's, let's come up with a way to get those dollars back because we're actually losing our dollar supply in some level. So let's see if we can get the Soviet Union to buy grain from us because they have bank accounts in dollars. Let's get the farmers to ramp up more production because we think they can do that. And that means the farmers make more money, the Soviet people are better fed, and we get our dollar supply back. It seemed like a win-win-win situation. You've probably heard people on the radio, uh, Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts getting on the radio and TV and saying to farmers, we will find you permanent markets abroad. Get big or get out of agriculture. If you don't get big, you will not be competitive in this global economy. We're going to create with permanent markets abroad. As you see in the chart, those permanent markets never existed. Because once the Soviets reclaimed their ability to produce their own grain, they stopped buying from us. We had ramped up production. We had piles of grain we could not sell. And the, the, the tragic thing was the pricing structure went back to what it was before, but there was a cu crucial difference. I, I interviewed, interviewed farmers in the 1980s who'd gone through this time, and they said, I went to a, pro a lender, both public and private, and they asked for a $225,000 loan, and they said, not a penny less than $400,000. If you don't get big as, as big as possible, as efficient as possible, you won't be competitive in this new global economy. So under duress, people took on more debt than they could pay, and they were promised that the prices would stay high. They said that they could have paid off the debts if the prices had stayed up there, but they couldn't, they couldn't uh, pay them off when the prices fell. So this peak now led, led to what we now call the farm credit crisis in the 1980s, when farmers realized they had taken on debts that they could not pay over the long haul. They went to bankers and said, write down my loan 20%. If you don't do that, I will lose my farm, and you will lose a customer. If you do that, I can continue to farm, and I can cash flow. The bankers recognized the wisdom of that, People negotiate a better deal so that agriculture could stabilize itself. Does that remind you of any crisis we've had lately? <laughs> and I think the real irony of this story is that we saw the same things happening in the housing and derivatives market, where the same process was at work, where lenders who needed a cash flow for the next quarterly report said to low income home buyers or to farmers, take out a loan we're not sure you can pay back because we need the cash flow. If we were closer to our farmers in this country, we would have actually recognized the trouble signs a lot more rapidly. We might have forestalled the housing crisis we had. But we let that happen. We let it happen to farmers, and we're kind of repeating those same mistakes over and over. We've actually had regional recessions across the United States since the oil crisis days of 73. And we don't realize that it's kind of tied to how we have a banking system taking wealth out of our communities. But the final thing I want to say in this story, on this slide, which I think is interesting, if you look at net income in 2011, the best year in history, notice it's lower than it was in 1929, which was 
nine years into a real depression in the United States, which was the main cause of the Great Depression of 1929. In 1929, we knew we had a crisis on our hands. We were rolling up our sleeves and saying, how do we get farmers better supported? Today, we think we're in the best years of our lives. Let's speed the world and go full steam ahead. It's a very rich story, the history of American agriculture. And again, you'd say, can you see any sign of American agriculture improving its financial position in the last 80 years? It's just not a story of that. It's something else altogether. So this is the context in which we do our work in Sheridan County. And it really limits our choices, but also gives us some incredible opportunities because we have local markets that are not being served well by this process. Another, th another chart I'd like to show, this is the amount of food that farm families hold for themselves to eat, feed their, their, feed their families, which in 1949 was a $20 billion market. Just the food that I would you know, serve my family if I was on a farm, the, the meat that we'd eat, the prep produce, whatever we can. And over time, farmers have responded to the call from commercial food industry saying, don't waste your time canning that stuff. You know, it, it takes a lot of time, it's hard, and it's a lot of work. Just let that go. You can make more money driving your tractor, driving your combine, buy better foods at the store. We'll, we'll give you a nice group, new grocery store in rural America so you can buy all kinds of foods from all over the world. Let go of feeding yourself. And I think you see what now, now basically farm families are down to almost zero as of the last farm census in terms of how they feed themselves. When I hear farmers in the, in the Corn Belt saying we're feeding the world, I kind of point this out to them saying we're not even feeding ourselves very effectively right now. If farm families aren't feeding themselves, who is? And I think this is kind of sobering data as well. Well, something else happens in 1973. We have a new enzyme process industrially that makes it very cheap to make what sweetener? High fructose corn sweetener. And we have piles of corn we can't sell because there's no market for it. The price of corn has suddenly become very cheap. And use of high fructose corn sweetener as a sweetener really rises very steadily until 1984. Use of sugar declines appropriately, as you'll notice. In those years, the use of sugar, of sweeteners as a whole, doesn't incre increase much. We basically substitute sugar, we substitute uh, uh, high fructose corn sweetener for sugar. The next year we start noticing our kids getting overweight. And as they become adults, we notice the same patterns. In 1976, the number of obese adults starts rising tremendously. And now is the number one category. The number of overweight people stayed about the same. The number of obese people has risen. And the number of extremely obese pe people is rising slowly and steadily. Now, there's a lot of complicated factors that explain this. One of the things that happens in the 1970s is we lose the two-parent family staying at home. We also often lose the homemaker who's cooking and kind of figuring out a balanced diet for everybody in the household. We have a lot more mobility. Sometimes families don't even meet together to have a meal together because they're off running after two careers or, or what have you. But um, there's also a connection to high fructose corn sweetener in this too. And the nutritionist I talked to would say that there is a connection that's valuable because if I eat something with sugar, I have an enzyme in my system that says, Ken, stop, you've had enough. With high fructose sweetener, there's no such biological signal telling me to basically change my behavior. It's very easy to have one more portion, one more sampling, because it's sweet and it tastes pretty good. To the extent you can actually say this is caused or connected to high fructose sweetener, you can say that obese children we see in our schools today are connected to the farm crisis in the 1970s because those connections go back to that time when we made corn so cheap and we created such a global system that really kind of conveyed that product in such large quantities. And I think that's a sign to me of how incredibly complex the food system has become in the last few years and why it's important to do small steps that help us move forward in a better way and things we have a little more command over at a very local level. Here's a greenhouse or hoop house in Chicago that uh, is growing food in the inner city for Chicago people to eat. A few more uh, scary facts and then I'll stop. <clears throat> in, the, in the country it says we feed the world, half of our public school students qualify for free or reduced lunch at school. We spend about $152 billion a year paying for the medical costs of foodborne illness. And we spend $174 billion a year on the medical costs of, of overweightness and obesity. If you total these two costs together, 152, and 174, you get $326 billion a year. Let's compare that with the farm, what farmers earned in 2011. It's almost as much as all the farmers in the United States made selling all the products they sell. So essentially, if I give $6 to a farmer for a bushel of corn, I give $6 to the medical system to pay me for the cost of my diet. 
to, cut, to treat me for the cost for my diet. That's how out of balance our national food system has become and why this local work really makes such a difference. Okay, let's, let's finish with some happier stories. This is, to my mind, what's driving the change in the United States today are, is that same desire that really drove Athens, Ohio in the 1970s, where farmers are saying, I don't want to put food in the truck and have it go away. I want to know my customers. I want a relationship. I want farmers, I want consumers who will come and visit my farm. I want to know that they're eating well and that they're enjoying my food. I want to have a relationship with them. The blue counties in this map are all the parts of the United States in which that's the strongest. And uh, I think there's some Wyoming counties in there. So um, that's, that's good news. Um, a lot, very strong in New England, very strong from Minnesota to Chicago, very strong in the Pacific Northwest, but every county that's blue in that map is a place where that thirst for connection between farmers and consumers is the most vivid. This is a chart showing the rise of direct farm sales nationally. You'll notice it's more than, it's doubled in the last 15 years. And in the last five years, from 2002 to 2007, 2007 um, direct sales from farmers to consumer was 10% per year. Compare that with the economics of the commodity industry we were tracking before. I would submit I don't know a single farmer that needs to sell to a neighbor at below their cost of production. Why would you do that? Because you can negotiate and say, this is how much it costs me to make it, and they're gonna say, sure, I want you in my neighborhood. So these are all at least paying for themselves, if not making some profit. And so despite the dismal national trends, you see some signs of growth and sustainability for agriculture when people connect in a very direct way. One of the things that makes me feel like I can eat well in Minnesota in the future is this greenhouse in western Minnesota. I visited this greenhouse on a, a very blustery cold day in January about three years ago. The temperature outside was 13 below wind chill. I had trouble standing up on my way from the car to the greenhouse. And um, this is a greenhouse that runs a um, CSA farm, a community support agriculture farm that sells fresh produce only from November <coughs> to April. They only sell within 30 miles. You can't quite see it in this slide, but the temperature inside the greenhouse at sunset on a blistering cold day in January in Minnesota was 65 degrees. It had been up to 85 at three in the afternoon. The design of this is that they have plexiglass, brings the sunlight in, it heats the atmosphere inside the greenhouse, they blow that heat down below ground. When they're building the greenhouse, they put sand and gravel down there to retain that heat. That stores it on during the day. At night, that heat rises and it uh, heats the greenhouse. If it should fall below 45 degrees in here, this propane heater kicks in and keeps it at 45, so nothing freezes. The last I checked in, the owners of this greenhouse said they spent $100 a year in fossil fuels to heat the greenhouse. Everything else was provided free by the sun because they did a clever design. If we don't have a lot more places like this in Minnesota to raise fresh greens, I'm gonna have trouble getting salad when oil prices go up, when you can't even buy oil, when we can't count on the supply coming from California and Mexico the way it does today. We're gonna to need to build these facilities in almost every northern part of the United States. Notice the soil is organic soil in a Home Depot gutter. And everything was built on four by eight foot sections, so you could take materials right from Home Depot and slap it up there without doing a lot of cutting or paint or, or trimming. They said, let's make this really simple for anyone to do and for themselves. They published a book with plans. They have the book also lists about 40 vegetables they've raised successfully, and they say, these are the ones that work the best, these are the ones we had trouble with. So you can actually learn from their experience to do your own greenhouse. And the plants, I think, look really happy in this artificial environment in the middle of January. So uh, but I can't tell you how much fun it was for me to be coming out of a cold wind and having a sample of very spicy mustard green inside a greenhouse uh, on January morning or January evening. Pete Scherf is a farmer in Michigan City, Indiana, and he had a fairly successful career as a businessman. You can see he's pretty young, but he, he ran a business that cuts, does, he basically uses lasers to cut metal and make very ornate grill work. And he said, you know, I got to where I actually made the grill for the White House fence. And I said, that, that seems like the pinnacle of this career. And you know, I'm kind of bored. I'm really glad I did that. The business is working well, but I want to do something more with my hands. I want to get out of the industrial thing into something like farming. So he spent three years doing a business planning process. A very shrewd businessman with lots of bankers helping him and SBA helping him. And what he concluded in his business plan was that he could make more money if he milked 25 cows than if he milked 150 if he bottled the milk himself and sold it directly to his neighbors. 
So one of the key factors for him was to say, I'm tired of having labor not show up. I'm tired of worrying about whether I'm going to have enough people to manage my farm. This is a farm that's small enough my wife and I can run it ourselves. If one of us is sick, the other one can take it over. If we want to go away, it's not that hard to find someone else to, to pick up and run the place for us. So he actually thinks he'll make more money with a small farm than with a large farm. And I think that's a very kind of um, important development in the I'm losing my sound. Organic food sales have been rising in the country in the same regions that direct sales have been rising. Uh, with one big exception, you notice southwest Wisconsin has a big outgrowth nationally in organic food sales. And that can largely be explained by Organic Valley, which is a national cooperative of cooperatives that started in 1988 in conditions very similar to what we're facing now. This is their corporate headquarters in a town of 432 people in, in Lafarge, Wisconsin. People drive two hours a day to get to work because it's some of the few jobs that pay well in this very rapidly expanding industry. In fact, they've expanded the size of that operation about a half again as large since I took this photograph. It's expanding very quickly. Here's their sales chart. In 1988, Organic Valley was eight farmers in a Wisconsin living room having a discussion much like this, saying, the economics are working against us. What are we gonna to do to make it different? And after many years of having some power struggles and some differences of opinion and some trial and error, they came up with a formula that seems to have worked. They decided to sell very high quality organic items to mostly metropolitan consumers with pretty good money. They were helped by the Silicon Valley explosion that gave consumer spending power to metro people around the country. They're now an $880 million corporation celebrating their 25th anniversary this year, projecting $1 million of sales in 2013. Uh, I talked to their accounting people over in December, and they said, we've never had a, a, a loss in that last 25 years. We target a 2.2% profit. We don't always reach that target, but we've never had a loss. So again, compare this with the economics of farming. It suggests that if you think differently about marketing, if you think differently about collaborating, you can actually find a way to build some good um, wealth at a community level by decisions to, to do business in a different manner. A lot of people you have, have met or know Will Allen, who was a professional basketball player who brought his savings back from Europe and decided to buy this greenhouse to be a training farm for African American and Hmong and Latino youth in inner city, well, suburban Milwaukee. The first crop was earthworms. And by taking organic food scraps from restaurants, from the city of Milwaukee, from other places, from the farm itself, they make a very rich quality compost that they take the earthworm castings and they dry it and pelletize it into a commercial scale fertilizer for Wisconsin farmers. Now, if someone had told me 20 years ago that inner city youth would be producing the fertilizer for Wisconsin commercial farmers, I would have said, what? But it's been happening for about 10 or 15 years already in Milwaukee. Again, a good example of reclaiming those input costs and bringing them close to home. Plus, the kids get to run this kind of ecological greenhouse. So you have tilapia fish inside this tank. The fish can nibble some of the plants. They get other plant food to, to feed themselves. The, water, the, the plants help clean the water for the fish. The manure from that water gets poured in the plants nearby. Kids are learning ecological cycles of the nitrogen cycle, ecological cycles of life. They're learning how to run a business. They're learning how to, to do work skills. And they are, they're, they're, they're selling about $600,000 of the produce from this farm in suburban Milwaukee. So a pretty nice economic engine that takes a lot of financial support from foundations right now. There's a very exciting demonstration of what can be done. Green Girl Gardens in Philadelphia, Mary Steven Corboy and her husband ran a restaurant in suburban New Jersey about 25 years ago. And they sat down one weekend and said, you know, we love our customers, we love our food, we love our business, but we see things getting worse in inner city Philadelphia, we'd like to do something to help out. So they actually took the drastic step of selling the restaurant. And they went to the city of Philadelphia and said, we want to start a farm in the city. And the city said, sure, but we got a deal for you. We'll give you a 99 year lease on a one acre parcel of land in the center of Philadelphia if you'll run a farm there. And they said, great, that's exactly what we wanted to do. They put cement containers down, you can see the corner of it there, so they keep the pollution below ground. They put organic soil in, on top there. You can tell that the plants, the peppers, and the tomatoes, and the chard are doing very well in that environment. They have hydroponic tables lifted up off the surface, again, to keep it pollution-free, but also to make it easier to harvest. Planting fresh greens. 
because they're restaurant tours and because they're in the center of the city of Philadelphia, they have about 40 restaurants nearby that can walk down the street with their carts and take that, buy stuff from their farm and take it back to the restaurant to serve. They can broker for 75 farms in the area that they used to buy from when they were running a restaurant. And by brokering food, by selling landscape ornamental products, and by selling food to local restaurants, on a one-acre farm in downtown Philadelphia, they sold $1 million of the product two years ago, last time I checked in. A dramatic, it compares pretty well with some larger operations I know in the Midwest, although they're very close to their market and they have some advantages because of that. But it suggests there's some different ways of doing agriculture we haven't quite imagined yet that might be just as lucrative as what we've been doing for years. This is their cold storage area built with some USDA plans, two by fours, fiberglass, an air conditioner that keeps things at 37 degrees year round. It's a safe cold storage area. Restaurants can come here and pick up their produce and take it back. They have also a very good place to gather in the community. Well, two more examples. The one I'd like to kind of focus on next is in southwest Wisconsin, not too far from Organic Valley, but uh, this is a case where I did a study of the food economy for Barocco, Wisconsin in 2009. And about three months later, magically enough, this factory decided to close overnight. It was a national company that had a printing and packaging operation, and they said, we can, we can be more efficient if we move our operation to Tennessee. Labor's cheaper. We can consolidate our operation and have some cost savings. And they took 85 of the best paying jobs out of a town of 4,000 people, Veroca, Wisconsin. This is the factory. Well, they, the, the head of the Economic Development Authority for Vernon County got on the phone with the executive who made this decision. And she said, we've been supporting your business since 1974 with incentives. We've been creating a good business climate. We've been on your side. How are you going to pay us back now that you've taken 85 of our best jobs out of town? executive stammered for about 20 minutes. He wasn't ready for this question. He kind of talked around her. And finally, in a weak moment, he said, what do you want me to do? And she said, sell us the building. And he did. For a very tiny price, the County Economic Development Authority took over a 100,000 square foot building that it was certified clean enough for handling food. And this is the model of what's now called the Food Enterprise Center. A young guy named Rufus, who runs Kuwait and Organics, is working with 120 farms and organic farms in the area to ship produce from from those farms from St. Paul to Chicago, 400 mile distance. He's ramping up very rapidly. A smaller cooperative called Fifth Season is primarily handling food from Amish farms and selling that into local schools and hospitals at a much more small scale. They each have their own separate space in this building. There's an organic herbal product store, there's a new coffee roasting business coming in, some other things will come in because they have a lot of space to fill. But they're networked with a meat processor across the street the local food co-op that brought the farmers into the Food Enterprise Center, schools and hospitals that promised to buy 10% of their produce from this place once it's up and running, Organic Valley with technical expertise, and Amish farmers willing to collaborate as part of the system. Notice the network of opportunity built around what could have been a disaster for a small town. They are now, Keyweight and Organics is now a $1 million business. Uh, and they're actually going to merge it with the Fifth Season Cooperative because they realize they have benefits by collaborating with Fifth Season instead of competing with them. Fifth season is selling about $100,000 of the produce a year now. They estimate that in about four years they will replace all 85 jobs that were lost with food-based jobs in organic local food industries. A tremendous turnaround which, of something that could have been very discouraging. To do that, they needed a new vehicle. They came up with an idea. They basically started, they started saying, we'd like to sell at an institutional level, but the, the problem that always happens is an institutional buyer will come in and say, we'll buy from you at, say, $5 a pound or $3 a pound. And then they call you up six months later and say, will you lower your price because we found a different supplier who can do it cheaper. And they said, rather than have that, buy, that battle every year, how about if we actually set up a system where the buyers and the farmers sit on one board together and design a system that works for everybody where the pricing structure can stay fair and everyone tries to keep that price structure together. So they have fifth season cooperative. Farmers distributor, a national distributor named Reinhardt, based in La Crosse, 40 miles away, is on the board of the cooperative. Hospitals and the Food Enterprise Center directly on that same board. Right now, right now, as of early 2013, they have 14 producers, three producer groups, four processors, four hospitals, and one food service on the board of this cooperative. And uh, what they do is they provide joint liability insurance. So instead of each farmer buying their own liability, if you're a member of the co-op, they have one liability pool that everybody contributes to. So you cut your insurance costs at about 14th. 
um, provides quality assistance training to all the farmers so that you can say, we're certified, we've been trained, that allows you to sell to large buyers. The USDA started out saying every time a farmer puts a load of meat on the truck, it has to be inspected. They said, how about if we treat all that meat as if it's safe, we can inspect it once. That saves the USDA money, it saves the farmers money. And by negotiating like that, they get to create space, reduce prices, and create a, a, a kind of more of a vision for themselves about what the food economy could accomplish. They still report, though, that pricing is an obstacle because, especially if you're a young farmer starting out, you get a higher price than the hospitals and the schools are willing to pay. And the one group of farmers that's been willing to re meet this market so far are Amish farmers who have a very low cost structure and have enough labor that they can actually ramp up production fairly readily at a fairly low price. So it's still some dilemmas in doing this, but it's a very exciting effort to really create a, a transformative web of relationships in southwest Wisconsin. My final example comes from northern Alabama, and I did a study for the food bank there, which I reported on about a year ago. It was 11 counties in North Alabama. And the food bank was wrestling with, again, the same question that drove Athens, Ohio in the 1970s. They said, do we want to continue to be a place where we just hand out food and get better and better at producing, or, or, or handing out more and more food efficiently every year? Is that really helping us? Because we actually started out with the mission to end hunger, and what we're doing is we're actually discovering that what we're doing is we're getting better and better at giving more food out. That's not ending hunger, it's not making us feel good. So they actually started a process um, which was kind of sparked into gear when they, one day when they raised some very tough corporate money to buy some canned peas, they discovered the peas were raised in China. And they said, why are we buying peas from 11,000 miles away when we have all the conditions here in North Alabama to raise beautiful peas ourselves? Why would we do this? Why would we raise tough corporate money to ship that money somewhere else? And they started working with a local farmer that uh, it's actually been borrowing eight backyards to raise fresh produce in. They said, we'll, we'll help you get that, market, that money, that, that food to a market. And uh, he's located in a low-income community. That the city, they arranged for the city of Huntsville to give him a bigger acreage of land that he could farm on more reliably and have his own farm market stand and have more of a production capacity in the community that would pay the livelihood for this farmer. And they're also now becoming a food hub in their own right. So they're basically saying, we'll be the aggregation center that not only brings food into the food bank, but also delivers the fresh, freshest food available from local farms to local restaurants, local grocers, and local schools and colleges and hospitals. So it's a very terrific turnaround of the idea of a food bank. And it's something that really becomes lo the logistical capacity of conveying food from farms to a whole community, not simply getting food to low-income people. So that's what I would say is my best guess about how we build in our communities health, wealth, connection, and capacity. Here's some people who are doing that pretty effectively with some complexity all across the country. And if you uh, need to find, track me down, this is how you do it. I also have cards here if you want to take one of those home. And uh, this PowerPoint also, Connie will have that and we'll be able to get that to you. They're making a video of this presentation that hopefully you can show to other people if you want to in the future. But. Um, with that, I'll just turn it over to you for any questions or comments you'd like to make about the speech or about your own work. Let's give Ken a round of applause. Questions? You're leaving already, okay. <laughs> I'm just going to make a phone call. <laughs> okay, good. Ken, what's, what place do you see for local food assessments such as those that you do and really charging things up and serving as a, a catalyst so that potential producers, economic development entities, and just the community at large can really get jazzed up about this? Is that a, a critical step? That's a great question. Can everybody hear that question okay? Should I should repeat that. Um, it's sort of like you just threw me a big softball, so thank you. So, uh, I, I think what I'd say is that the the typical typical discussion about local food kind of runs charging down the road and says, let's start making a food hub happen, or let's start making a processing center, or what have you. And they don't step back to say, how does the economy work in the first place? And I think that having that data really gives you a much stronger position because you can say to a funder, to an investor, you can say, we've done our research and we know how much food we're buying. We know what the market's like. We know what we're producing. We know the gaps between those. And you can throw very good hard facts and figures into that proposal you have or your investment business plan, whatever. And it gives you a real sense that you know what you're doing and you've done some of the homework to really tell the story. But I think the other thing that we're kind of typically finding in the studies is that um, 
you know, what, what I think this suggests is that I have an, I, I worked with an economic developer in Oregon, and he, we had a meeting with him about three years ago, and he said, this small food thing, small food thing is nice, but it's small potatoes. It was his words, small potatoes. And what was interesting was he lost his job a year later because he wasn't doing any deals developmentally. He, he was waiting for the big housing complex to happen. He was waiting for a big factory to come in, and nothing like that's happening right now in this economy. And instead of working with his neighbors who wanted local food sourced, he actually took a direction that lost his job. Um, what I think this data shows us is that the way the conventional economy is working is fragile. It's not being very rewarding. There's no reason to think that it has to be protected at all costs. In fact, it should be improved with better policy and better relationships. So that I think we, we really learned from the data that we have nothing to lose by shifting our assumptions and kind of changing some of our habits about how food gets from the farm to our plate. I also feel like the data has been very helpful in lots of communities I work with in terms of creating a sort of center point for the discussion where people can say, I, maybe some of you have been in front rural communities where you know Joe has an analysis he's been hanging on to for 35 years, and John has an analysis he's been hanging on for 25 years, and every time you have a farm meeting, they, they have the same argument, they never get resolved. Some of those communities can kind of take my data and say, this is good enough to move forward with. It may not be the whole answer, but it's enough we can kind of find a center where we all work together. And I'm finding this is inspir inspiring bipartisan work. It's inspiring people to kind of think differently and think, we can actually create a new alternative rather than fight the same old battles over and over again. So I think this helps build, uni it helps unify local foods efforts. It gives them some data to work with to really make a stronger case. It helps bring some new partnerships to together. And it really kind of reminds us that we have very little to lose by doing the right thing. Where a lot of people start out assuming that if we do the right thing, it's going to cost, um, cause damage to the mainstream system we have. And I can tell more stories about that, but I won't unless you, uh, if you want to cut those off, ask me another question. Do many of the communities that you work in take on a fair bit of debt to build these processing centers and that sort of thing? As a community organization, will they? Great question. Uh, you take on a lot of debt to do this. Well, uh, in the case of Western Wisconsin, they've taken, they took a lot of emotional stress on, but not a lot of debt because they didn't really have the ability to get big loans. So the, uh, the association, bought the building for a tiny price. They own it outright. There's no debt on that. And then they went to the uh, Economic Development Administration nationally and said, give us a $2 million grant so we can take the asbestos on the building, put some skylights in, clean up the floor, get a better water system, bring this up to a kind of industrial code for today. And they got that as a grant. They got a grant from the Wisconsin by local by Wisconsin grant process to help plan that process, and they've gotten other funders, USDA has chipped in money as well. So they, by, by doing a clever job and a lot of proposal writing, a lot of lobbying, and having a lot of help from their senators, their national, congressional uh, delegation, they've been able to get grants to really make this a process that doesn't pay for itself, but hasn't cost them money. Uh, but it's also not easy to do, and they've, you know, they, one of their big funds of money they got the commitment, and it took them 18 months to actually have the money delivered. They started to wait forever to get the money in their account. Now, um, in, the, in the case of like the greenhouse in western Minnesota, that was a $20,000 loan from a credit union that they paid off in six and a half years. Not strictly in their farm production, but they, they, one of them had an off-farm job, and because they had that income and they were selling produce, they were able to pay off the loan pretty rapidly and make it debt-free. So. Um, you know, um, when I see, and there's a couple of communities in Wisconsin where there's just a wealthy person in the community that says, uh, we want a food aggregation hub, I'll buy the building and we can decide how to pay for that later. I, I have the money to buy that. I, um, I don't have to take a loan to do that. And we'll learn over time how to make the best use of that facility. And since it'll be debt free, we have a little bit more freedom to operate than if I was taking a, a loan to make that purchase. So you have a lot of informal relationships like that moving forward too. I think most of us who are doing this work don't have much capacity to take on debt. And we need a lot more equity investments. We, and, and some of this stuff is going to happen through a combination of loans and grants, or sweat equity and grants, too. And I think we, we have some people who say, if it's not paying for itself in three years, it's not a val val valuable idea. But there are some very central businesses of this that have taken a lot of uh, grant money, finding a very important purpose, and hopefully build the infrastructure over time at maybe 20 years which makes a paying business or a profitable business possible. Organic Valley was a lot of sweat equity, a lot of credit. I mean, when that takes off, it's because they get attract investors who, who 
bought $5,000 shares or more and put money in the corporation so they could move forward. So there was a lot of debt in that transaction, but they've kept that to manageable levels. It's really every trick you can think of, depending on what your resources are. And because we have such unequal resources in the United States, different communities can do different things because of the, the people that are there and the, the risks they're willing to take. We kind of touched briefly on the quality of food that comes out of big agriculture with the high of corn syrup and that whole conversation. I was just wondering if you know very much about genetically modified food. Okay, <laughs> well, it's certainly not my area of expertise, but I, don't, I know I don't like it. Uh, and the question, if you didn't hear the question, was what about industrial agriculture and high fructose corn sweetener and, and genetically modified foods? And I, um, it's, you know, I, I can only say simple things about that because it's not something I study day in and day out. But uh, first of all, there's a lot of very large scale industrial operations providing fresh lettuce daily that's you know, not full of sugar, it's safe enough, it's inspected by the FDA, or it has safe practice behind it. But, but I think because of a need that those producers have to differentiate their product. They like to have cut, washed, and plastic bag wrapped lettuce, which is a more fertile ground for disease than if you just sell a head of lettuce. And one of the dilemmas of that industry is that when we don't have time to prepare food and buy a head of lettuce and cut it and wash it ourselves, it creates a, a, a product that can be sold for a good price, but it also involves some inherent risk with having it, having it that way, where I'd be probably safer buying a head of lettuce myself and then washing it carefully and paying attention to how I handle it, but also paying attention to where the, what farm it came from, if I can know that. In terms of high fructose sweetener, I think it's, uh, you know, you see that the use of the, the um, people stop buying as much soda as they used to buy. A lot of people move from high fructose sweetener in their consumer preferences to sugar or to a, another sweetener. And you see consumers reacting to this, but the obesity question, the overweight question is really hard to solve. Um, they're not simple steps about this. I know I'd like to lose more weight than I've been able to. Uh, there's just a, a lot of, you know, we have a lot of habits that are, that are ingrained and I think it's a very tough thing to kind of get us to, to eat a better, uh, higher quality diet. And the social pressure tends to keep us consuming because that's what we do a lot socially. So those are tough issues. Um, but you see consumers really changing what they desire and really trying to kind of putting pressure on the industry to, to come around and that's gonna happen over time. In terms of GMOs, um, the, 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 the way I think about that is basically that we have a principle in science which says you don't do something unless you're really sure it's going to be safe. And I don't think we've done that due diligence with genetically modified foods. I have no trouble with hybridization. I have no trouble with kind of encouraging a plant to have traits that we think are valuable for our, ourselves to consume. That's how we have corn today because that started out as a very small grain that got bigger and got more nutritious over time. I think that's a very good process because the plant makes a lot of choices of its own about how it's going to respond to the natural environment and acclimating to the climate where it's growing up and, and making decisions of its own, if you will, about how it's going to grow. But once you start injecting genes, I don't think we really know what the implications of that is. I was talking to a farmer um, who called me up just to tell me this fact last week, and I haven't looked into this, but he says, there are now scientists who are discovering that the micro, micro, microbiological level of the soil the microbes are actually communicating through DNA. And so if you, if you imagine that the, the fertility we need is being produced by microbes, if the, the, if the health of the soil is being produced by those microbes, and we're putting new DNA in there, I don't think we have any idea what the impact of that's gonna look like. And I don't think scientifically we know how to prove that it's safe. And until we know that, I don't think we should be doing that myself. Um, I think the other thing is I'd say is, you know, this is not a history of not producing enough food. We produce plenty of food. Price hasn't been very good. It's really much more a question of how do we support farmers and how we build relationships between farmers and consumers. That's the central question. It's not about producing a lot of product. And, and again, the folks who say we have to feed the world and we have to get ready for nine billion mouths, we're not doing that effectively with the way we farm today. And doing more of that's not gonna get us better. So that's, that's my soapbox on that. Yes, sir. Have you done much research on vertical farming? On vertical farming? I've done no research myself on vertical farming at all. Um, the Certainly, Growing Power is going to be trying that in Milwaukee, although they've been talking about that for several years, and I've not seen the building really come up. And I, 
I would say that the people I'm in touch with would argue that vertical farming is really questionable because it takes so much energy to heat that kind of space. And that, um, you know, I can kind of understand a, a solar heated greenhouse that's kind of drawing on heat from the ground. But when you get to f four or five stories and a lot of sun exposure and a lot of glass you have to put up there, I think that it'll be very tough to show that that's energetically efficient enough to, to really thrive. But if someone shows it can be done, that more power to them. And we, we definitely want to experiment with that and see if it can be a viable system. Have you had experience with that? Well, we're kind of working on some prototypes. Okay. Um, so we've got some small ones and, and hopefully, you know, a different technology other than using glass and things that are extremely, extremely energy yeah. consuming. You know, that if, you have, if, you, if you're willing to share some of the stories about what you're doing to try to come up with a better approach, I'd love to have you say that here. So. Well, um, one, one thing we've come across to solve the glass issue is there's a product called ethyl tetrafluoroethylene, TFD is the name of it, and it's okay. like traditional um, greenhouse materials that deteriorate in five to 10 years. You know, it has a, a UV degradation of 50 plus years. Okay. You know, it weighs 1% one, 1 of the weight of glass, and so by, by using different options based upon, I mean, because in the consumer market, you can't really go buy this at Home Depot or anything right, like that. Right, what yeah. We're given technology to use. Yeah, and, sure, yeah. And by us asking for what's really available and things that are biodegradable and things like that, I think that's going to help. It's going to help. It becomes profitable. And, you know, it's a direction to head towards, definitely. You know. Well, I sure wish you all that experimentation. I, you know, and if I can, you know, help you uh, in any way, I'd be happy to help. I think the. The, the question for me about some of the new technologies is basically that if I imagine a future when oil is too expensive for me to buy and I need oil to make that stuff, to make the ethyl tetrafluoride or you know, ETFE, if I um, need really high-tech equipment to build the facilities I'm going to work on, and that could be true with hoop houses, it doesn't just mean vertical farming, but the more we can get back to materials that can be grown locally and kind of generated from inside, the more we have a resilient system. And I, that's just a one test to kind of ask ourselves as we go forward and say, we, we definitely want to do the experimentation. If we come up with a mod, good model, let's go for it and we'll show how, what it can do and what it can't do. But there's some really interesting questions to kind of wrestle with about uh, assuming for a long-term future, how, how would we plan? But go for it. <laughs> yeah. You had a question too. What do you think about this one line argument? Um, well, the question is, what do I think about the slow money organization? And that's not a very interesting answer, but I would say, uh, as an organization, I don't think I have a lot to say about it, but I would say the slow money movement, the kind of way that the, the, the vision of slow money has inspired people is really very potent, I think. And, you know, Woody Tash's book really put that issue on the radar of a lot of people in a very dramatic and quick way. Um, my favorite slow money story is uh, the... Um, Farmer, I, I spoke, I gave a speech like this in Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, about three years ago. And it was a, a, I was speaking at the county fairgrounds, and I was in a very kind of rich, long standing, people have been farming there since 1774 or 1750 or whatever. And a, a guy came up to me, he was about 35 years old, and said, I'm, I'm going to farm here. And my neighbors pulled me aside and said, You know, land is $60,000 an acre here. You're not going to buy a lot of land. But what we'll do is we'll each give you, there's eight, eight neighbors, they all each chip in $10,000 of money for him. And they said, we don't want the money back right away, but we know you're going to pay us back, and we want you in the community. And to me, that's the ultimate kind of slow money story, where people have said, we'll invest in you because we want you here. And, you know, some of those folks can afford to lose $10,000 if the guy can't come up with the money. But it's really much more about community building than about debt. And I think those informal deals where people say, Maybe I'm wealthy and I've got $3 million. If I lost a million dollars on a food, center, a, food, a food hub, it wouldn't be the end of the world. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll still have $2 million left when I'm 70 years old. And, and I think people are stretching the limits of what's expected. And, I, and when, they, when the stock market was very rewarding, it was very hard to talk about slow money. We tried to invest in fund in Minnesota, and people just didn't get it because they could say, I can invest in the stock market. But we were saying, wouldn't you like to invest in local companies you can drive by and, and talk to? And now that seems very smart. But um, there have been people doing this kind of informal exchange for decades. It predates slow money, but slow money has animated a real kind of nice image about how that could happen. And it's really inspiring a lot of investors to think differently about their portfolios. So I like that, that vision quite a bit.
Yeah. Two of the examples you gave were um, people concerned about low-income people getting food and instead of getting them food, how right. to right. build their capacity. And the one was at ASAP where they created their own food processing. Yes. Um, what entity kind of took that on? And, you know, was it? <laughs> you know, was it a college? Was it a church? Or you know, how did? Uh, it ASAP itself is a nonprofit. Corporation 51C3, and they run the kitchen, the commercial kitchen, and they they've been so successful they started two or three others around Southeast Ohio. So they basically said we're going to build this. They got a lot of federal grants to get started. They got some private donations to get to build their capacity and have the ability to staff up. But um, they just said we'll start it. We're going to own it. We're going to run it, and they still operate it. And they, and they train other people on how to build similar things in their region, in their communities too. But the initial people who started this, did they have particular expertise in these things? Um, yeah, actually, no. At the, at the time they started, they didn't really have it. I think you know, what you had were some of the folks who started the um, Casa Nueva restaurant and who worked in the food cooperative and worked in the farmer's market. They had some history with food. They knew how to do business in the local community. They had some trust as business people and as folks who were uh, visionary. Um, but they just said, this is what we need to do. We'll learn how to do it. And they were able to get some grants to help them have the staff time to learn about that and to make it work as, as fully as possible. They could also hire a, they could hire a commercial chef to help them run the kitchen. They didn't have to know how to do that. They just had to manage the process. So um, you know, a little combination of having some business acumen, vision, uh, a real sense of faith from the community, but also the resources to to dive in and do some experimenting. So yeah, not all not all these things work. You know, Organic Valley could have easily broken up in 1992 or whatever. It was, there were a lot of power struggles about what the vision that should be. So not everything is flourishing, but um, when you do it right, when you find that kind of sense of trust and, and mutual accountability, some very dynamic things can happen. I, I would argue that behind all these efforts is a core of people who can work together as a team. Leaders who say, this isn't about my ego, it's not about me controlling things, it's about Four or five of us saying, we each have different skills. Let's bring those to the table and do what we each can do. Let's coordinate our efforts together and let's communicate really openly and move forward for a bigger purpose. And I think all those efforts have a sense of shared leadership. Certainly Barocco does. Certainly ACENET does. Snowville Creamery. Warren wouldn't do this without close neighbors and with close friends helping him out. He's, he's a very independent-minded guy. He likes to do things his way, but he also understands he's part of the fabric of life that he wants to support. Yes? Um, well, it's kind of following your question, because I see a lot of um, private partnerships and maybe quasi-public private, but I didn't see a lot of government, because I assume the Animal Development Association was probably a 501 secret or something. But I mean, like the, the VA, we have a Veterans Administration here that serves people that have land, you know, that kind of thing, but then are there regulations that would inhibit something like this, because it's federal, County, there's probably food yeah. regulations. Good. Right? Uh, that's a nice, broad question. That's, there's a lot, a lot to tackle there. So I don't know if you heard the whole question, but basically, what's the role of the federal government in this? Public money? Um, how do regulations either help this or interfere? And there's a very, I mean, we could talk for an hour just on that set of issues. But briefly, what I'd say is the the ASNET project in Ohio, very early in the process, got a grant from USDA to build that. Community, to build a program around the community kitchen. They, did, they, they couldn't get federal money for the building, but they did for running the program. They had a three-year grant that really helped them get that on its feet. Uh, Greens Grove Gardens in Philadelphia, even though it's owned by a private company, private uh, couple, they got money from USDA to build that facility too. Same grant program, community food program. Um, so it's probably like a mapping grant. Well, I mean, it, 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 it does require a match, um, but you know the, the people came up to do the match because the federal government had a funding source to give it. So it was, it was local ownership, it was a local vision, local board, but it was the federal government basically investing in a local vision rather than telling it what to do. And I think that's a real key thing that that program at USDA has that very few programs are quite as good at. Um, now, there's a lot of regulatory issues, and I'm, I was sitting over lunch today, I'm, I'm reading the FDA rule on produce and processing, and that's 550 pages of very difficult stuff to read, but there are some ways that I think that could interfere with where we need to go, because it really sort of has some assumptions that make it hard for us to do some of the work we'd like to do. 
And there certainly are individual inspectors who are very helpful and say, I want to do everything I can to make this possible. There are other inspectors who say, I'm going to follow the letter of the law and you, don't, you have to follow my order or you can't do what you want to do. And part of it is getting inspectors to realize that they're part of the process of building a food system and not regulating us, not making it more difficult. Um, some of that's federal, some of that's county, some of that's state. Um, really traceability, right? traceability, but you know, also the, the, the shorter your, your distance from food to plate, the less you have to worry about tracing. And, and you know, luckily we have the exemption for some farmers in the new FDA rule that if you're selling more than 50% of your product direct to customers and you sell less than $250,000, if you meet both those criteria, you are exempt from any of the new regulations. But if you want to sell to an institutional scale, you have to really meet those terms. Um, the Barocco Center to EDA grant, that's a public grant of $2 million. So I would say uh, there's no federal vision to say, go out and make this happen. This is all being invented at the grassroots level. And primarily it starts with a community that's got a lot of social sense of connectivity and a good history of treasuring itself. And then they develop an idea and then they ask the federal government or the state government to invest in their idea. And over time, higher and higher levels of government and bigger funders step in and, and help out. Um, it would be bad, I think, to set a policy of the federal government to say you're going to build regional food systems because that would probably backfire. But um, also, asking the government to invest in building community food systems rather than throwing cash after commodities is a really big shift we have to make too. And did you have anything, any, was there any place where you worked with gardens and then, for instance, this is beef and lamb country, right? But we don't have a USDA, you know, regulated processing plant right. for commercial beef in the U.S. So even the people that are trying to do natural fed beef, that kind of thing, or grass fed beef that they want to sell, they have to go to the customer. They can't sell it in the store. I'm sure there's loopholes. No, we're not able to do that right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they have to ship it yeah. you know, miles away in order to bring it back and have it be legal. And, and unfortunately, you know, people have to shift uh, cattle a long ways in many parts of the United States. You, you know, the, I worked with some growers in Arizona who were shipping 350 miles to their local processing plant. It's the closest one they could find. <laughs> and uh, it's a huge issue because, again, the industry's gotten so centralized and we've assumed that it's, it's good as public policy to invest in large infrastructure because that would create efficiencies where, in fact, what that does is take capacity out of our regions. So we have to change how we think about investment and we have to change our incentives through tax policy and all the other public incentives to say we're going to support local processors that actually do local work. And, uh, and you know, in some cases we may need state, reg state regulation that's equivalent to USDA that really allows you to trade food that's U.S. states inspected across state lines too. I think that would be a very important step to take. And, and uh, you know, we have a pilot doing that now, but it hasn't been set into law yet. We have time for one more question. I just have a question about the um, the industrial agriculture that you've seen in your travels. Yeah. You know, I've read and seen stories about you know a farmer basically being held hostage. He's got one product, a monoculture that he bought into was one large consumer. Yeah. And then this consumer actually then uh, sues farmers that won't buy into him on either side when their seed blows into their their field and then they say they're stealing it because they have the time and the resources and the money and i'm wondering if you're seeing a shift in the you know it was basically helplessness you know yeah. The people yeah um are you seeing a shift in you know that there's this grassroots movement are you seeing a shift in like, i really people am yeah. really yeah. able to take back control well, I, you know, I'm not sure we're close to taking back control, but I think there's a, there's a sense that if we don't take more command over the structures we're trading into, we're, we're going to lose that. And um, I'm, I'm hard, actually, well, you know, let me first of all tell you the story about the most negative comment I've had in my history of doing these speeches. I, I gave a speech in 2003, and a, a, about a 75 year old farmer shuffled to the microphone. He said, You don't understand. And I was ready for him to take my head off and tell me why I was wrong in my analysis. And what he said was, I've got all these debts to pay. And, and I told him, I thought I did understand what he was saying. He was saying, you know, you took on a debt, you're going to be faithful to that banker, you're going to pay that off, and you've got a combine, you've got a tractor, and you've got a field, and you're not going to change your farm. You're 75, you're not going to start raising produce. And I'm not asking that people who are doing large-scale industrial agriculture stop doing that, because that would be senseless. Mm -hmm. But what was really interesting was he was totally agreeing that the economic analysis was right, but he was saying, I feel stuck. Mm -hmm. 
that's what I yeah. You know, and and that's where a lot of people are. A lot of people are farming at what is a very small margin or a loss because they hope they can make it up by selling the land for development later. The hopeful signs I see would be a farmer in Indiana who I interviewed for my Indiana Food System study who said um, he works, works for the Indiana Farm Bureau as a staff person. His job is to help farmers kind of configure their farm operations. And he said, I had a chance to buy my father's farm. It was 500 acres. And I thought about it and said, I don't want his farm. I don't want to farm the way my father farmed. I want to farm in a very different way. And moreover, I can't afford his farm. So we bought 90 acres, and he's talking about a CSA, about processing his own milk, about hoop houses. He's, he's still making his plans, but he said, that model doesn't work for my generation. I'm going to do something differently. Um, I think um, as the big industrial farms, especially in a state like Minnesota, which has a, you can't, a corporation can't own land in Minnesota. So if you have a 20,000 acre farm and you're an individual and you want to sell that to your heirs or you sell that to someone else, who can buy that land, that 10,000 an acre? Um, that creates a real weak point in the system where that transition will be difficult in many states to carry off. What I th um, another story I like to tell is from, uh, I was speaking at the Organic Conference in Wisconsin a few years back, and a, a young guy came up and said he just studied uh, agriculture at the University of Illinois, he had an MBA with a focus on agriculture. And he said, when I got out of college with my master's degree, I, I talked to my father and said, you know, every year you complain about the five acres behind the barn. You say it's too small for your big tractor, you can't turn around, there's not enough light, let me plant vegetables. And his father said no and said no, but finally when the guy came back with a degree, his father had, sure, had to say, sure, try it. In his first year, he made more money in five acres of vegetables than his father made in 400 acres of grain. Wow. And suddenly his father's helping him out with his farm operation. Um, there's a farm in Indiana where a farmer who's very wealthy and politically quite like, like connected is helping his two sons, one of whom does GMO industrial crops and one is taking old hog barns and converting them into greenhouses. And he says, which of my sons shall I not support? <laughs> but he's, he's helping them both out on his land. And he's basically saying, this is really a future I want to cultivate. And I think, you know, one of the parallels I see is the war in Vietnam, where a lot of the generals and the admirals and the military only turned their thinking when their daughters came home from college saying, how can you support that war? And I think we're in a similar educational moment where people say, dad, let me farm a different way. Give me five acres of land if you can't use it. Or, support me to do something in a different style than I've done before. And those small efforts are going to look small for a while, but they're going to mount up to quite an interesting, interesting kind of cultural tussle and some new transformation as we do that over time. So that's, to me, the weak points of the system we have. It's not sustainable, clearly, economically. It's um, very vulnerable because it depends on this kind of monocropping stuff you talked about, which will be environmentally devastating. It also, I think, um, requires a lot of oil that we may not be able to afford in 20 years, or we're going to frack the universe to get oil at the price we can afford. So we, we, it involves choices I don't want to really see us making. So a lot of vulnerable points, and I think the more we create a lifeboat now that gives us some place to go, as that crumbles, we have a lot more chance of success. Thank you very much for this. I, I really get so much out of discussing things with, with this. It's a really good educational process for me as well. Thank you a lot. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and we have some exciting programming coming on in the next couple months that we want to share with you. Um, the first is the Powder River Resource Council's film series. Do you want to talk about that, Bill? You bet. Uh, next Wednesday, the 17th, down at uh, Sheridan Centennial Theaters, we're going to have two shows of films, one at 4.30 and one at 7.15. And the films, are, they're beautiful films, but they also have, have a story. They're talking about a lot of youth doing good things in the community. We have some issues with global change going on. Uh, we have a lot of people taking on challenges and doing something inspiring. So I, I uh, urge you all to come and see these movies. We're going to have some great giveaways with some of our local sponsors like Warehouse Market and Killies. So we'll have giveaways. You get to see films for 10 bucks, And each show uh, that you want to go to, they're, they're separate film all through the night. So it'll be a good time, and I hope you can come along. Great. All right, then the next one after that is Saturday, April 20th here on campus. We're having the Sheridan Local Foods Expo. And you're welcome to pick up one of these on your way out. Um, and this year we're also joined with the Earth Day Festival. So there will be lots of activities for kids and it's all free. So I encourage you to come to that. 
Then on the 30th, um, we have a natural resource um, presentation. You want to talk about that, Keith? Sure, yeah. Um, the natural resource lecture series this year is going to be uh, on fire, fire history that uh, has occurred in the Bighorn Mountains here as well as the Northern Great Plains. Uh, PhD student from uh, the Sacshaw, North Dakota State, but doing our work in Eastern Montana is coming down here to speak. And it's going to be four speakers. The second one is going to be Bernie Bornong with the uh, Forest Service here to talk about the Gilead fire last year and kind of where the Forest Service is on that right now and plans for the upcoming season of what the fire may be looking like and some of their plans and management goals. Um, and then we've got uh, from Padlock Ranch talking from a rancher's perspective of the 80,000 acres or so that they uh, had burned up last year and kind of their plans from a rancher's perspective of how they're going to tackle that this year with invasive species, the fire history and around the area. And then uh, some research, a fire research ecologist out of Miles City at the ARS Research Station is going to be here to talk about some of the current fire research history and, uh, and uh, some of the stuff they're doing right now in the eastern Montana and northern Wyoming area. So. That'll be April 30th. Uh, it's going to be 6 to 8.30. It'll be a little bit longer with, uh, with four people speaking. So. And there's a flyer for that as well if you want to get one on the way out. And then finally, um, I want to tell you about, our, we're going to do the Food for the Thought film series again this year that we started last year. Um, it starts on Thursday, May 2nd. And this year it's going to be down at the DSA office. So caddy corner from the courthouse. The first film will be May 2nd, 6 o'clock. And we're going to be showing dirt. So, as you can guess what that's about, um, we encourage you to come out. And that will be every other Thursday leading up to Farmer's Market. So, we'll keep you busy till September. And again, thank you very much for coming tonight.